Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Hamre, dear John, uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be here and to address this uh, distinguished uh, audience and to be in this uh, beautiful uh, building. And uh, uh, you told me, John, uh, when we were sitting in uh, the room behind there that uh, your family is from Norway, and that's great. Uh, but you told me more than that. You told me that your family is from uh, Voss and Granvin. And Voss and Granvin, that's uh, uh, perhaps the two most beautiful places in Norway at the West Coast, at least Granvin. Uh, the only problem is that when I was Prime Minister, I was responsible for building a power line uh, to Granvin. Uh, <laughs> and that was one of the big, big you know, say, conflicts I had uh, during my time. As, uh, so I've never been back in Granvin since I... <laughs> since I built uh, the power line, but uh, if you go to, together with me, I will dare go back to Granvin. Um, and I also know that you are very proud of your uh, Viking roots, and there are many reasons to be proud of that. Um, and uh, in addition to that, you have uh, received uh, the uh, Royal Norwegian Order of Merit, and that is the highest honor my country can bestow on uh, foreign citizens. And uh, uh, combined with the fact that you, for many, many years, have um, worked so hard to develop uh, the bonds and the cooperation between North America and Europe, the transatlantic bonds which are so uh, vital for our uh, security. I think the, the fact that you have these uh, Viking roots and that you have the Royal Norwegian Order of Merit and your engagement here at the uh, CSIS all of that makes you a perfect host uh, to a Norwegian NATO Secretary General to speak about our changed security environment. And what we as uh, a transatlantic community need to do about uh, it, about the uh, changing uh, security environment we are uh, facing. So uh, we are at the turning point uh, for Euro-Atlantic security. We face raising challenges. The very fabric of our security order is at stake, and we must be prepared for the long haul. And that is why we need to adapt. To the south, the challenges are complex and diverse. The Arab Spring has turned to brutal winter. Failed and weak states uh, are fueling regional instability and sectarian strife. ISIL and other extremist groups spread terror and intolerance and uh, inspired attacks from Paris to Texas. And people, and people move in large numbers, many to flee and uh, others to fight. NATO is playing its part uh, in addressing these challenges in the Middle East and in uh, North Africa. And I am ready to... Um, set out what we are doing in greater detail during our discussion. But let me, in my opening remarks, uh, not address the challenges we see to the south, but focus on the challenges we are facing coming from the east. And then I promise to answer questions related to the south afterwards. The challenges we see uh, coming from the south uh, are clear, and they are coming from a resurgent Russia. Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea and its continued destabilization of Ukraine have brought armed conflict back to Europe. This conflict has already cost over 6,000 lives. There are continuous ceasefire violations, and heavy fighting could flare up at uh, any moment. That is why I fully support the efforts of the United States, as well as Germany and France, to find a political solution to the crisis in Ukraine. The path to peace is the full implementation of the Minsk agreements. So I urge all parties to take that path. Russia has a special responsibility. It supports the separatists in eastern Ukraine with training, weapons, and forces. And it maintains a large number of troops on Ukraine's border. But we cannot look 
at uh, Russia's aggressive actions in Ukraine in isolation. They are part of a disturbing pattern of Russian behavior that goes well beyond Ukraine. And this pattern undermines key principles of European security. Respect for borders, the independence of states, transparency and predictability of military activities, and a commitment to resolve differences to diplomacy, not force. First, let's look at respect for borders. The UN Charter and the Helsinki Final Act are clear. Russia actually helped to draft these documents and sign them, but it has broken its commitments. Crimea has been part of Ukraine since the country became independent, but Russia sent in troops without insignia, organized the so-called referendum, which met no international standard, and seized part of another country. President Putin even admitted publicly that Crimea's annexation had been planned in advance. After the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, Russia recognized two Georgian regions as independent states. It has taken almost full control over both and built fences between them and the rest of Georgia. It has also sent troops into Moldova that Moldova wants out and, and which Russia pledged to withdraw in 1999. So Russia has been violating the territorial integrity of its neighbors for years and continue to do so. That brings me to my second principle, the independence of states. Ukraine's desire to move closer to the European Union was met by force. So was Georgia's aspirations aspiration to join NATO. Moldova has also received clear warnings about closer moves toward Europe. Russia's leaders claim that its neighborhood rep represents a zone of privileged interests. But its efforts to create a sphere of influence risk taking us back in time to when greater powers, when great powers drew lines on the map at the expense of smaller states. And nations were not free to decide their own destiny. This could create a sphere of instability for us all. And it's not the sort of Europe we want, we will accept 25 years after the end of the Cold War. The third principle is transparency and predictability in military activities. For decades, we, build, we built a stable European security system based on fewer forces, fewer weapons, and fewer large exercises, on more information sharing, and on arms control agreements to build trust and confidence across former dividing lines. These agreements reduce the risk of conflict and miscalculation. The, conven the Conventional Forces uh, in Europe Treaty put limits on number of movement and movement of equipment like tanks and fighter planes. But Russia unilaterally suspended implementation. The Open Skies Treaty allows us to look at each other's territory from the air to increase transparency. But Russia is obstructing these activities. The Vienna document sets out rules for reporting large military exercises and allows for inspection. But Russia has found ways around it to avoid notifying the largest military exercises in the post-Cold War era. Three of these SNAP exercises 
have included over 80,000 troops, moving over great distances and at great speed. One such SNAP exercise in February of last year was used to deploy forces to annex Crimea. Others masked support to separatists in eastern Ukraine and led to the buildup of forces on Ukraine's border. As I speak, Russia is conducting yet another SNAP exercise with 250 aircraft and 700 pieces of heavy equipment. NATO, on the other hand, strives to create transparency and predictability. Our largest exercise in 20 years will take place next fall in Italy, Portugal and Spain. It was announced one year ago. It was not a SNAP exercise. International observers, including Russia, will have access to our exercise. And you can find the schedule of our planned exercises on NATO's website. Because we have nothing to hide. Whereas Russia is doing all it can to minimize the transparency of what its forces are doing. And this brings me to my final principle. Resolving differences through dialogue, not forces. Through the pattern I have described in Ukraine, in Georgia, and in Moldova, Russia has shown the will to use force or the threat of it to coerce its neighbors. And Russia's recent use of nuclear rhetoric, exercises, and operations are deeply troubling, as are concerns regarding its compliance with the International Nuclear Forces Treaty. President Putin's admission that he considered putting Russia's nuclear forces on alert while Russia was annexing Crimea is but one example. Russia has also significantly increased the scale, number, and range of proactive flights by nuclear-capable bombers across, across much of the globe. From Japan to Gibraltar, from Crete to California, and from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Russian officials announced plans to base modern nuclear-capable missile systems in Kaliningrad, and they claim that Russia has the right to deploy nuclear forces to Crimea. This will fundamentally change the balance of security in Europe. We learned during the Cold War that when it comes to nuclear weapons, caution, predictability, and transparency are vital. Russia's nuclear saber rattling is unjustified, destabilizing, and dangerous. All of this takes place against the background of Russia's significant rearmament program. Some of its new military systems were put on parade during this year's Victory Day celebration. And Russia is um, deploying many of its most modern systems and basing military units near NATO borders. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, these are not random events. They form a bigger picture which is of great concern. Russia is a global actor that is asserting its military power, stirring up aggressive nationalism, claiming the right to impose its will on its neighbors, and grabbing land. We regret that Russia is taking this course, because when might becomes right, 
The consequences are grave. For 25 years, we have worked hard to include, not isolate, Russia. Our aim was a strategic partnership. Borders were opened, trade went up, and trust increased. The G7 expanded to become the G8, and Russia was invited into the World Trade Organization. We created the NATO-Russia Council and offered to work together on missile defense. We cooperated in many years, from countering piracy and terrorism to helping Afghanistan. All of this benefited us and it benefited Russia. But today, the choices made by Moscow have taken our relations with Russia to their lowest point in decades. We are not back to the Cold War, but we are far from a strategic partnership. So we need to adapt to deal with the challenges that may be with us for a long time. This adaptation, we are doing it in three ways. Reinforcing our collective defense, reinforcing our deterrence and defense. Managing our relations with a resurgent Russia and supporting our European neighbors. First, strong defense. NATO's core task is collective defense. Our commitment to defend each other, enshrined in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, is as strong and as relevant today as ever before. That is why we are implementing the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. We have increased our presence in the eastern part of Europe, in the air, on land, and at sea. Boosting our air policing and beefing up our exercise programs. We are doubling the size of, NATO, of the NATO response force. Its centerpiece is the spearhead force with lead elements ready to move in as little as 48 hours. Seven European allies have, co have volunteered to lead the spirit force over the coming years. And we are establishing new NATO command units across the eastern part of our alliance. To make it easier to our forces to exercise, deploy and reinforce. Yesterday, I thanked President uh, Obama for his leadership and for America's quick and substantial contribution to reinforcing our collective defense. Through the $1 billion European Reassurance Initiative and Operation Atlantic Resolve. Everywhere I go across the lines, I meet US servicemen and women. Their presence sends a clear signal. America stands with Europe and European allies are in lockstep with the United States. This is transatlantic teamwork. But for all of us, there is more to do before the NATO summit in Warsaw next year and beyond. We are enhancing our cyber defenses and making clear that the cyber attack could trigger a collective response. We are actively developing how we deal with hybrid threats, including by working closely with the European Union. We are speeding up our decision making and we are deepening our intelligence sharing. We are carefully assessing the implications of what Russia is doing, including its nuclear activities. Keeping NATO strong does not come for free. So we must redouble our efforts to meet the defense investment pledge we made last year. To stop the cuts 
and gradually increase spending to 2% of GDP and spend better because we cannot take our security for granted. And this brings me to my second point. A strong NATO is not only our best protection, but, it's also, but it also provides us with the best foundation to manage our relationship with Russia. We do not seek confrontation with Russia, nor do we seek its isolation. We still aspire to a constructive relationship with Russia, because that would benefit the Euro-Atlantic security and the whole international order. But Russia has changed, and we must adapt. In doing so, we will not change who we are. We are sticking to our principles and to our international commitments. We are committed to preserving European security, institutions, and agreements. We will remain transparent and predictable. We will continue to respond to disinformation with information, not propaganda. And we will keep the channels of communication open with Russia, both military to military and diplomatic. Because <clears throat> there is no contradiction in strengthening our collective defense and staying open for dialogue. A vigilant dialogue where actions speak louder than words. And in this dialogue, we will firmly uphold the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all European countries. And this brings me to my third and final point, supporting our partners in Europe. It is in our interest as a transatlantic community to have neighbors that are stable and independent. That is why NATO is working with Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine to help them to carry out reforms and build strong institutions. These nations are not buffer zones. They are independent, sovereign states. They have the right to choose their own path, and we will continue to help them on that path. Because if our neighbors are more stable, we are more secure. Ladies and gentlemen, for decades, as a transatlantic community, we have kept our peoples safe. We have erased divisions in Europe. We built a rules-based order which benefits us all. But as our challenges increase, we must adapt to ensure our security, to protect the values of our open and democratic societies, and to support our partners. This requires continued commitment and solidarity. The world is changing, and we are changing. But one thing that will not change is our determination to stay and stand united. Thank you.